Hello, and welcome everyone to our seminar tonight, our lecture tonight. I'm so pleased to be joined by Dr. Jeffrey Morrow, who's going to be our speaker. Um, as we have people just trickle in, we're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to go over for anyone about our Holy Week programs and services this week. So for all the students at Princeton, uh, just to go over this, that this week for Holy Week, there will be adoration as usual on Tuesday from 9 to 10 p.m. at St. Paul's. And throughout adoration, you'll be able to go to confession to prepare for Easter. Confession will be available both face-to-face -face and behind a screen, whichever you prefer. This week for Holy Week services, Aquinas will not be running separate Maundy Thursday services. It will just be the services at St. Paul's. And for St. Paul's, you need to register. And to register, you need to have registered at 9 a.m. this morning already because it filled up very quickly with everyone's enthusiasm after last year when all those services were closed. So if you'd like to be able to celebrate Maundy Thursday with the community, you can watch the live stream from St. Paul's. You can ask around to see if anyone who's a student has reserved a box at St. Paul's with extra space in it that you can join. So, so four people can sit together in a box. Um, or you can sign up on St. Paul's wait list in case people have signed up and ultimately aren't able to make it to that service. On Friday, there will be similarly full services at St. Paul's, but Aquinas will be having its own Stations of the Cross at 7 p.m. The Stations of the Cross will meet outside the University Chapel at 7 and then set off for a walking Stations of the Cross, then no registration will be required. Because of Stations of the Cross, Alexi and I will be moving our seminar on friendship earlier in the day. So we'll be meeting in our backyard at 23 and a half Chestnut at 5.30 p.m. so that we can wrap up by 6.30 p.m. We can recruit you all to help clean up the backyard and still have time to make it to Stations of the Cross. And Father Zach will be concluding his current seminar on uh, Grant Petra's case for Christ in our backyard also on Tuesday prior to adoration. Now, when it comes to Holy, um, Holy Saturday itself, we'll be having an 11 p.m. vigil mass. So we will truly be ringing in Christ's resurrection, going in all probability past midnight, spilling out onto the streets of Princeton with loud rejoicings as everyone else is asleep to proclaim the good news. And I can't use the word to say it until Lent is over, sadly. But please join us then, no registration required, just your hunger for the good news of Christ's resurrection and your willingness to celebrate with all of us. On Easter Sunday itself, there will not be a special Aquinas Mass at 5 p.m. So if you're planning to go to Mass on Easter Sunday, again, you're going to have to go through St. Paul's website to register. But as long as you're willing to stay up, there is no registration required for 11 p.m. And now today, I'm really delighted to, to kick off Holy Week, to kick off our meditation on who Christ is. We have Dr. Jeffrey Morrow, who is the Professor of Theology at Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University. He's the author of a number of books, most recently, Liturgy and Sacrament, Mystagogy and Martyrdom, Essays in Theological Exegesis. And he's the co-author with Scott Hahn of Modern Biblical Criticism as a Tool of Statecraft. He's the husband of Dr. Maria Morrow, who is also a theologian and author, uh, but they don't, you know, praise God solely in their written works. They are also the author, the authors, the parents of seven children, all of whom we pray will be saints glorifying God. Dr. Morrow, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, especially uh, during Lent as we begin Holy Week, right? So I'm, I'm excited to talk to you tonight about a... Uh, an event that's really important in all of our lives. It's important in my life. It's important in our liturgical calendar. That is the resurrection of Jesus, which we will celebrate on Easter Sunday. So without further ado, I want to talk a little bit about um, this topic in the sense in which I bring it up in my book on this topic, Jesus' Resurrection. A Jewish convert examines the evidence, and that is with my own story and how I investigated the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, which is a historical event, but it's also one that's trans-historical, right? So God entered history living a human life in Jesus, and he rose again from the dead after his crucifixion on Good Friday, the first Good Friday. So when I first encountered this, I was a freshman at uh, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and I was a Jewish agnostic. That's how I would have described myself. I had a, a bit of a Jewish upbringing with, with a you know, Hebrew school after day school, had a bar mitzvah, but I was more of an ag agnostic leaning towards atheism. 
I didn't believe in God, but I conceded, well, maybe some God exists. And I got challenged by um, some members of a Bible study in my dorm that year to examine the claims of Christianity. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but I, I went through the historical trustworthiness of the scriptures, God's existence, various philosophical arguments in that matter. But the one that we're going to focus on tonight is the resurrection of Jesus, which was an important one for me. I remember that that first Bible study, one of the leaders said, uh, he quoted from St. Paul in the first letter to the Corinthians, where St. Paul says that if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. But at that point, I actually didn't know that neither that Jesus, Jesus' resurrection was part of Christian faith, that he rose again from the dead, nor that it had anything to do with Easter, right? So I actually entered, I don't know how I went to public school without figuring that out. I did at some point, probably around the third grade, I figured out that Christmas had to do with Jesus's birth. But I went all the way until the first semester of my freshman year of college before I realized that the Christian celebration of Easter celebrates Jesus's resurrection from the dead, or even that Christians consider Jesus divine, that he was actually God living a human life, right? Human and divine natures. So I began to investigate this issue. I thought, this is, this is the foundation of Christianity. If I can show that Jesus never rose again from the dead, this is just some kind of mythological text, right? Well, then these guys at least will leave me alone. <laughs> that was kind of the idea. I didn't want, you know, I thought it's okay. If Christians want to believe this stuff, that's fine. In fact, I felt uncomfortable asking questions in the Bible study because I didn't want to challenge anybody else's faith. But the leaders clearly wanted me to believe in this. And so I thought, well, I'll show them. Okay, so that's kind of what I, what I did. So I read pretty widely in, uh, from scholars from a wide variety of perspectives, uh, agnostic or skeptical scholars, most of whom actually came from a Christian background at some point, Jewish scholars and others. And I examined some of the historic claims against the resurrection. And that's where I started to see the evidence for the resurrection unfolding before my eyes, right? And what I want to do is I want to, I want to kind of section off kind of historic claims with more recent claims, more recent being since like the 1980s, 1990s. So it's still kind of older. But some of the early claims you you got were things like um, uh, they went to the wrong tomb. Right? That was one of these early claims that you found. This is over 100 years old. This, this claim that, well, the disciples, they really wanted to believe in Jesus's resurrection. And so, you know, they didn't really know where he was buried. So they went to the wrong tomb. And of course, nobody had been laid there. So it was empty. And they just said, ah, oh, he must have risen from the dead. Now, what that does take into account, which is, I think, helpful, is that Jews would have believed in a bodily resurrection. We'll return to this a little bit later, but they would have believed in a bodily resurrection. So if they believed that Jesus rose from the dead, they would have understood it as bodily. They, they wouldn't have been able to have a faith in the resurrection if his body was still in the tomb. Right? So that was significant. But what I started to realize as well is that Jewish burial practices at the time, we know quite a, a lot about them. And this was a time where, where you would visit the tomb of somebody who died that was your friend, your relative, right? And so, in fact, there were actually two burials that would take place in the Second Temple period, so the broad context in which Jesus lived before his time and slightly afterwards. You were initially given, usually, a first burial, right? And so for about a year, and there'd be a mourning ritual, and people would visit the tomb regularly, um, and... And then after the body had decayed at the end, they would take your bones out of that. And they would put it into an ossuary, a bone box for secondary burial. Right? And that might be a more special tomb. And this was especially the case for uh, people who had family members who were still alive, close friends and relatives. And it was also the case of religious figures who had some kind of prominence. And so people would visit their tombs. So it's, it's unlikely that nobody would know where he was buried. Again, this wasn't, these weren't, the disciples weren't in some far off part of the world. All of these events happened over a period of days in Jerusalem, right? His death, his burial, the claims of the resurrection. So this is not kind of in some hidden corner somewhere. It's not like they first preached in India or in Egypt. This all happened in Jerusalem within a matter of days, right? So that's, that's the first thing. So that, that was a really hard one for, for me to believe in. But the next one I examined, which actually is even more difficult, is what's often called the swoon theory. And that is that Jesus maybe survived his crucifixion, okay? This actually I found among some uh, Muslim apologists more recently has been revived, which is interesting because typically within Islam, 
Jesus as a holy prophet never suffered death. So he actually didn't suffer on the cross. Typically what you'll, you'll hear in traditional Muslim apologetics is that you know maybe Judas was transfigured and he actually was crucified as opposed to Jesus or something along those lines. But I have run across some who will argue some version of the swoon theory that he didn't die, but he did kind of was on the cross for a period of time. The difficulty with this uh, is already kind of implied in the text. Right? If you read the accounts of the gospels, the Roman soldiers are instructed to break the legs right, of the thieves of the cross, for example, to hasten death. Right? And so we know from crucifixion accounts from the ancient world, since this was a very common Roman means of execution, that the way you typically die from crucifixion, it's not blood loss. In fact, many crucified victims weren't even nailed. They might have been just fixed with a rope, but it was asphyxiation. Right? You die because you couldn't breathe. And so what you would have to do on the cross to breathe is you would have to move up and down. There was, there was motion involved. So if you faked death, eventually you would do in fact what you were faking. You would die. You would not be able to breathe. It would just simply hasten your death. So the breaking of the legs prevented crucifixion victims from moving up and down in order to inhale and exhale. So you broke the legs. They would just, as long as they could hold their breath, that's how long they would live. They would pass out. And they would die because the blood would not be going to the brain. So if Jesus had faked death for those hours on the cross, he would have actually died, right? And again, the Romans are very careful. Like they would double check, ensure the death. That's why we have the account of, of the piercing of Jesus' side of the Gospel of John chapter 19, just to be extra careful that he, would, that he would die. But even if that were, let's just pretend for a minute that the medical evidence and all the Roman evidence was, was um, faked and you know, maybe it's wrong. Even if you came up with this idea that Jesus survived the torture of crucifixion after having been flogged with the 39 lashes that he would have had in his body put in a tomb, you still have the question of how did he get out of the tomb? How did he emerge out of the tomb? And moreover, how did he convince people to follow him, to change their lives radically in the way that the apostles did? And neither of these explanations made a lot of sense. The swoon theory emerged in somewhat of a vacuum both the swoon theory and the theory about the wrong tomb emerged in a context where skeptics simply wanted to avoid the resurrection. They didn't know about Jewish burial practices. They didn't care. They didn't know really about Roman execution practices. They didn't care. So they were trying to get whatever they could to get out of the resurrection the supernatural explanation. Now, the theories that I came to that I thought were a little bit more persuasive and which ac accounted for the missing body were that some form of robbery, some form of grave robbery, whether by grave robbers, whether by his own disciples, or whether by the Jewish opposition or the Roman opposition, okay? So let, you know, the grave robber one is an easy one to take care of because grave robbers steal things of value. They steal gold, they steal money, art, something that they can sell. They're not gonna be able to sell a dead body. So there's, there's really no motivation or evidence that a grave robber would have stolen Jesus's body. Nor does that really explain the conversion of the apostles, right? Because they were converted not only because of the empty tomb, but because they had eyewitness appearances of Jesus. It also doesn't explain, right? It doesn't explain the birth of Christianity beyond the apostles, but all of the people he, he saw after his resurrection, right? So that didn't make a lot of sense. But what about the idea of either the Jewish opposition or the Romans stealing the body? Again, the biggest, biggest problem with that is then there would be no Christianity. All they would have had to do, right, if Caiaphas, if the members of the Roman cohort Pilate, if somebody wanted to steal the body in order that Christianity wouldn't get going, when all of the apostles were claiming Jesus rose from the dead as he said he would, all they'd have to do is say, but he's still dead. Look, we have his body right here. And then again, they wouldn't have been able to do that if the message were preached in India or Egypt but it was preached in Jerusalem in a, in a matter of days after Jesus's crucifixion, after Good Friday, you have that resurrection joy, that infectious zeal of the apostles going out and you have the conversion of people, right? And then of course, 40 days after when Jesus ascends into heaven, you have Pentecost and you have a much larger conversion of Jews and eventually Gentiles as well, coming to faith in Jesus. And that didn't seem to fit very, very well either, strained credibility. What about the apostles? This made a little bit of sense in the sense that, well, they would have a motive, right? Fake the resurrection. Now you have followers, wealth, fame, 
kind of like some you know religious leaders today, some might cynically think, except they didn't get wealth and fame, right? If any of them had wealth, like maybe Matthew, they gave it up, right? Bartholomew was skinned alive. Peter was crucified upside down, right? St. Paul, who was not a member of the original 12, who became a follower with much suffering involved in that, he was beheaded, right? He, in fact, before that, he had had the 39 lashes, not once, like Jesus, but on five separate occasions. He must have had many, many scars, right? So as I began to study this, I began to uh, agree with um, Edwin Yamauchi, who was an ancient historian whose work was very important for me, who said that if anything is true or certain about this time period, it is that the apostles were completely convinced of Jesus' resurrection, right? If this were not the case, they had everything to lose and nothing to gain, but nothing to gain because they were tortured to death. That's how we know they were completely convinced. People die for things that are false all the time, right? But people don't usually die for lies. They know our lies. But if the apostles were involved in a plot to steal Jesus's body, they would have known better than anybody that it was a lie. Why would they have been have submitted to torture when they had nothing to gain but death? They didn't gain anything. I mean, we believe they gained heaven but they would have had to have been convinced of that. And that's the point that I think is really important. And we have parallels for this. We have people who are tortured and they say, no, I, you know, I don't believe. Even when they really do, right? Torture is one of those things where we just want the pain to stop. I'll say whatever you want, just stop hurting me, right? We have messianic claims, right? So Bar Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba revolt, where Bar Kokhba argued that he was the Messiah later. We have others. And later, when some of these messianic figures are threatened with torture and death, they say, I was just joking. It's not really, I'm not the Messiah. Don't hurt me. That makes sense. What does not make sense is for you to suffer torture and death for something you know is not true when you have nothing to gain from it. And I think that's, that's significant. And it wasn't just one of these figures. You might say he's extra tough. It's all of them, right? And so the historical evidence indicates that all of them suffered torture and death. The Apostle John may have, you know, he was boiled in oil. The tradition is that he survived that. And maybe his later death might have had some, you know, relationship to that from being weakened. We don't know. Um, some of them, there might be some debate about, but the majority of them have strong historical evidence, as all the uh, historical evidence indicates. And that's, that's significant. Some of which came out even later, after I uh, continued to study this, long after my conversion. You know, the evidence, as I've continued to look at it, has been increasingly strong. So then what do we do with this? How do we explain all this? Well, what I've noticed is that scholars, even in that time, this is the late 1990s, scholars typically don't argue for those arguments because they know they're very weak, right? What they try to do instead is get out of it by saying, Jesus may not have been given a burial at all. Right? So this was this became a common argument that you would get in the 1990s, early 2000s. Sometimes you hear it now, it's less common now. People just don't wanna usually address that. You know, so why would they argue that? Because when the Jews revolted against Rome about 40 years after Jesus' death, that's what happened. Right? Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian of the first century tells us that the Romans were crucifying about 500 Jews a day outside of Jerusalem. And what did they do? They didn't bury them to war. They just threw their bodies off the crosses into gravel pits, I'm sorry, uh, limestone pits. And, you know, animals would feast on them and, and the, the limestone would take care of the bones. So the most famous author here is John Dominic Cross, and there's others. But John Dominic Cross argued that's exactly what happened. So why, what happened to the body? The dogs and the carrion birds fed on the flesh of our Lord and the bones were dissolved by the limestone as happened to so many other Jewish victims in the Jewish war. So I ended up writing a research paper on that topic. And what I discovered was he's correct about what happened during the war, but he's reading that back into 40 years earlier during the Pax Romana, right? Where, where there was peace between the Jews in Jerusalem and the Roman empire. There, there's no historical evidence for the denial of burial in peacetime under the Roman empire. In fact, what we have is the exact opposite, right? So even though some of these scholars will say, well, you're crucified, you're, it's a shameful death, you would be denied uh, an honorable burial. That's just not true. The archeological evidence indicates the opposite. We, we actually have the, um, the bone victim, we have the bones of a man, Yehochanan, 
who was not only given a primary honorable burial, but he was given the bone box, the secondary burial as well. How do we know he was crucified? Because he has a nail from the crucifixion still stuck in his heel bone, right, in his calcaneus. So again, this also gets to the claim that some historians said as well, we don't have evidence for nails being used apart from the New Testament in crucifixion. But again, that's not true. We actually have, we have the, the nail still stuck in his heel bone. Right? So it's not a lot of evidence, but it is archaeological evidence that supports the New Testament account, both that nails sometimes were used in crucifixion, and moreover that during the peace time with Rome, a crucifixion victim, which is the most dishonorable form of execution the Romans had, so dishonorable and shameful that you could not crucify a Roman citizen if you were a Roman citizen, that you were still given an honorable burial because in Judaism, that was very important and it still is, okay? So I had to kind of wrap my mind around this. So what do we do with all of this evidence? Right, I'll, I'll give you one more. This is a quotation from Geza Vermesh, who was this great Jewish scholar of the New Testament and early Christianity at Oxford University, passed away a few years ago. In his famous book for the 1970s, Jesus the Jew, he writes the following. He writes, in the end, when every argument has been considered and weighed, the only explanation acceptable to the historian is that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation, not a body, but an empty tomb. End quote. And I had to wrestle with this. Why was he so convinced of the empty tomb? Why was he so convinced of the burial and the empty tomb? And the eyewitness accounts to this. And as I studied it, as he explained, I started to realize because of the incriminating evidence of women being the first eyewitnesses. Like this isn't invented by Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code of a few years ago. Everybody, everybody thought that Dan Brown was the first to realize women were the first to see the empty tomb and the risen Lord. No, that's actually the New Testament itself, right? The Catholic Church and all Christian churches have been preaching this for 2000 years, right? But why is that significant? Is it significant because you know women can't tell the truth? No, of course not, that's not true. But that is what was thought at the time, right? And that was enshrined in both Jewish and Roman law. Right, so women's testimony was banned both from Jewish courtrooms under ordinary circumstances and from Roman courtrooms. So we hopefully all know that women can tell the truth. They, their laws did not reflect that. And so what's significant is that what was the weakest argument then for the resurrection of Jesus, at least for the burial and the empty tomb and the eyewitness accounts is actually the strongest argument today. And that is the testimony of the women. That would have been seen as an embarrassment for the New Testament because the cultural context and the legal context in which they operated was one in which you could not rely upon, you could not rely upon the testimony of women, right? Um, and yet they did, they couldn't get out of it because they were, right, the first witnesses. And so that convinced skeptics like Geza Vermesh that Jesus must have been buried and there must have been an empty tomb. He actually wrote later, I believe it was 2007, when he wrote a book on Jesus' resurrection. And in there, he reaffirmed his argument for the historicity of the empty tomb, the burial in the empty tomb, and he added one more. He said that the women testimony has actually also convinced him of the eyewitnesses of the resurrection events. Now he won't, you know, it's, it's kind of in, incredible because he doesn't want to go further than that. He never wanted to say that Jesus rose from the dead. He wanted to say that that supernatural event is not open to the historian. And to a degree, I will, I will agree with him. And that's beyond what we think about within the discipline of history. But he couldn't accept a theory of hallucinations for the eyewitness accounts. And that was interesting to me. And why? Because hallucinations are private and personal. If I'm having a hallucination because of lack of sleep, which I know something about with my children, or drugs, or whatever, I'm seeing or experiencing something that's not there, right? It's happening inside. So we're not going to all have the same experience of the same event. And yet that's exactly what happened. The apostles and others saw the risen Lord in different contexts. So all the evidences together are very difficult to explain, right? How, how do you even remove the body, right? So there would likely be tombs sealed with boulders or whatever. Why? Because 
it protects them from animals coming in and desecrating the bodies and eating the body. It's the whole point of burial is that the person's body can be protected, right? Because they venerate the body. The body is, is something of dignity. It's very important in Judaism and in Christianity, right? And then you have the Roman guard that's being sent. Right? I think this, this is really interesting. I get this from William Lane Craig. It's a really interesting apologetic that you see already assumed a polemic, already assumed in the New Testament. And that is what? It's a Jewish Christian polemic. Christians, the early ones are all Jewish as well. Right, so, so the Jewish opposition to the Jews who believe in Jesus, right? The Jews who believe in Jesus, the Jewish disciples are saying, Jesus has risen from the dead, right? The Jewish opposition is saying, no, he's not, right? The disciples are saying, no, the tomb is empty. The response is, you stole the body, right? And then the disciples respond, well, how could that be? There's, there's a guard at the tomb. And what is the Jewish response? It's not, you know, there's no guard at the tomb. He was never buried. It's that when the guard was asleep, you went and stole the body. The Christian response is, right, the um, uh, members of your leadership told you to say that. They paid you to say that. Now, what's interesting to me is that it's very clear the New Testament is trying to convince its readers, or at least support them, that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the message of the New Testament, all right, central. And yet, it already raises one of the most powerful arguments against the resurrection used in history. That the disciples stole the body. Why bring that up unless it's because that argument is already being raised? Does that make sense? And so I think that's important because what we're seeing is an actual live polemic, a back and forth going on that's already recorded there. But notice what both sides agree on. Death, burial, empty tomb, and even guard at the tomb. That's significant. So whatever theory I had to come up with to get out of Jesus's resurrection, which at this point I really wanted to do. It had to explain the mechanism. How did they remove Jesus's body from the tomb? And it had to explain motive. If it were the Romans or the, or the Jewish opposition, they could have ended Christianity very clearly, very, very quickly. If it were the disciples, then why did they die torturous deaths? Nobody dies for what they know is not true. So the combination of that quickly led me to realize that Jesus's resurrection, the traditional claim of Christianity, is really the only adequate explanation that takes into account all of the historical facts. The resurrection may not be a historical fact, but his death, his crucifixion on a Pontius Pilate, which is mentioned in the Jewish historian Josephus for the first century and the Roman historian Tacitus, as well as the New Testament, the burial, the empty tomb, and the claim is that he appeared alive after the death to many people are historical facts. And that's really what helped lead me to faith in Jesus, initially as an evangelical before I became Catholic, which is a whole other story. Um, and I think what's significant about that is this is not simply a historical matter. It is a matter of faith. And what's important is that Jesus' resurrection means that we too can be raised. So this is the central claim of Christianity, but it's more than just a claim. It's an invitation to relationship with God. And for us Catholics, it's really important because how do we experience the lived resurrection, the grace that Jesus unleashed for us on the cross and through his resurrection to the sacraments, right? baptism, the Eucharist, confession. And so I would encourage all of us to really, really appreciate what we have, this great gift that we have in Holy Week as we continue Holy Week, to really prepare ourselves for Easter well so that we can, we can live Easter faith in resurrection such that we see the risen Lord alive in our lives. Because I think in the end, that's really going to be the more effective apologetic. For me, these were important issues I had that were intellectual. But as I've gotten to know more and more converts, both from Judaism, from other tr Christian traditions, what I real and for the religious traditions, what I realize is really what seems to be most effective is a lived Christianity, right? What we might call an apostolate of friendship. Right? And so we cannot give what we do not have. And so I think the most important apologetic we have is actually going to be right, our relationship with Jesus, our joyful relationship with the risen Lord. That's something worth passing on, something worth dying for, and therefore it's something worth living for. So I think we have some quite a bit of time for questions. I'll end with that. If we can open up the floor to any questions people might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrow. I think that is really where we want to begin Holy Week, meditating on the reality of what Christ has done and what he is doing in our lives. 
Uh, and Zoma, I'm going to raise you up to be a panelist for a moment uh, so you can ask your question and for everyone else, you can submit your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And then I'm going to promote you to panelists so you can ask your question and then pop you back down after you ask. Um, and if you have a question you'd like to ask anonymously, you can submit it anonymously and then I'll ask it. All right, Insoma, go ahead. Um, hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for speaking. It was really a pleasure hearing um, all of the evidence that you spoke of about the resurrection. So my question was, um, I've often heard from um, other people who I've talked to, um, agnostic and atheist people, that um, it's not merely the idea of Jesus' resurrection that they found hard to believe, but they found hard to believe the Bible as a historical, has historical fact. So I was wondering if you ever had that problem as a agnostic and how you came to terms with Excellent question. Yeah, that was my problem. I mean, I didn't, that wasn't the topic, so I didn't go into all of that, but that was definitely my problem as well. Um, I mean, I just came into college thinking it was just mythology, like, you know, Aesop's fables or something. And so what I did is I, I began to read what, what did historians say about this? What is the evidence for and against? And I initially I started with kind of traditional kind of what you might call Christian standard evangelical Protestant apologists which I found of varying degrees of helpfulness, but what was helpful for me with them was um, that they actually pointed me to other sources, both skeptics and, and believers alike. And what I found was a lot of the arguments from the skeptical historians tended to be arguments from silence, all right? And what's important here, I, I'm gonna quote again from Ed Yamauchi, partly because he was one of my teachers at Miami, but he has, his work is very important as an ancient historian, is when we look at the ancient record, you know, we should be surprised when we have anything that survived, really, because of what once existed on various archaeological sites somewhere, most of the sites haven't been discovered yet. We're continually discovering new sites, a lot of places we don't know where they are. Of what has been discovered, right, most of those sites haven't been completely excavated. Think of Jerusalem. People live there. You can't excavate the entire city. Of what's been excavated and discovered, a small fraction of it's actually been explored by scholars, right, because of funding and time and whatever. And of what has been explored, very little has been published. So we only are aware. So first of all, of what once existed, very little has survived. So we only really have a fragment of 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 what once existed, right? So an argument from silence makes no sense because absence of evidence, considering such a fragmentary nature of the archeological record, absence of evidence can never be positive evidence of absence. And yet that's exactly what a lot of the skeptical historians will argue. What I find incredible and what I found incredible is, is everywhere we have comparable evidence from other ancient sources, the Bible does incredibly well. Right? So I would recommend a couple different texts now that weren't available to me then, but can, to do a much better job, I had to read a lot of stuff to get, to get to this. The one for the ambitious, for the Old Testament, the, if you're ambitious, I, I highly recommend Kenneth Kitchen's On the Reliability of the Old Testament, which he wrote in 2003, which is, you know, it's massive. It's like 700 pages. Um, if you want a smaller version, I recommend Walter Kaiser's book, The Old Testament Documents, Are They Reliable and Relevant, which he published in 2001, which I don't like that section on the canonization of the uh, of Old Testament, but the rest of it is excellent. And that's pretty accessible. And in the New Testament, there's a lot of good stuff out there on the historical trustworthiness of the New Testament. I think one of the excellent ones, a great place to start, is Bram Petrie's book uh, that Leah mentioned, um, The Case for Jesus, which is an excellent book. It's a great place to start uh, right there. But I would say that the Bible is the most historically trustworthy collection of documents from ancient history. And I found myself looking at it saying, if I'm not going to trust this, I got to dismiss all of ancient history because it does better. Hopefully that helps. I mean, we could, you know, could take piece by piece of what issues people have, but that's the general view, I would say. I think that is such an interesting thing to weigh you know, when we're we're used to learning in history class about things for which our knowledge, you know, is often slightly distant or indirect without us kind of writing off all of human history. So that that question of what is our usual standard um, applied to this more intense claim. Uh, Melvin, I'm going to move you up next to ask your question. So here he comes. Thank 
you're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank, thank you for your talk. I found it really interesting to hear about your experience and the, the arguments you encountered and how you um, grappled with them. Um, I was very curious to hear about what your what um, how your friends and family might have reacted to the you know historical developments you discovered, um, your conversion in faith, and how um, what that was like, how you responded to them. Uh, thank you, thank you for asking that question. Um, in general, it was very difficult. I think I, so. I ended up writing. My dad wasn't very happy at the time. Um, I ended up writing a uh, I don't know, it was over a hundred page handwritten letter to him with all some of the just summary of the notes I had taken on some of these things. Obviously, it didn't convince him, but at least he read. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't talking. This was a very intense process for me. And it was very short, so I wasn't talking to them about this. So they kind of came out of the blue for a lot of them. So it was very difficult. I think emotionally hard for them. For some of my friends, especially, I mean, there were some friends that basically cut off relationships with me. I think with most of them, we've kind of reconnected in some form, but it's, you know, it transformed a lot of our relationships. Um, I'll say that. It was hard. Uh, you know, I think whenever we move closer to Christ, we do face the danger of that straining our friendships or relationships just because of something so important to our life. It's It's hard to... It's hard to have a relationship where that's not true for the other person um, yeah. without in any way that meaning we love them less, but it, it would be hard to have the same kind of friendship with someone who didn't believe in the materiality of the physical world, who thought it was all illusion, you know, and to, to have that friendship be the same as someone who believes you fundamentally exist in the same world together. I do have an anonymous question here, um, which is, you know, of someone who's asking, you know, that they they agree that the apostles' proclamations of faith and endurance of torture are strong evidence, uh, but don't other faiths have it, many instances of adherence dying for their beliefs despite torture and persecution? You know, what what do we make of those claims in face of people's willingness to die for them? Excellent. It's an excellent. I, I think one thing it it all definitely communicates to us that these people believe truths that are worth dying for which I always think means that they're worth living for. So what does that say for us? But on the truth claim, I was making a very particular claim, and that is not that the apostles died, therefore, to torture death, therefore Jesus probably rose from the dead. Rather, their death, their tortured death, shows that they probably did not fake the resurrection. And that's the thing that I think is different, is that with other faiths, we, we likewise have martyrs but they're not being tortured to death for things they faked. They didn't make it up, right? So what, what I think the death of the apostles does for us at the historical level is it tells us that they probably did not steal the body. If they had, they wouldn't have suffered torture and death. It doesn't mean Jesus rose from the dead. He may not have rose from the dead. That's where, for me at least, it was all of the pieces come together in the resurrection. That's just one piece that shows they at least probably weren't part of some kind of plot to, you know, to steal the body. It shows their sincerity, which couldn't have been possible had they done that. But I think that does something else for us as well. And that is that the martyrdom is an encouragement for us to live a martyrdom in the context of our lives. Most of us as Christians are not going to be called to be tortured physically to die, but we're all called to deny ourselves and live love for others to, to give, you know, that witness to Christ in our concrete circumstances. And I think that the testimony of the martyrs should be an encouragement for us to live Christ's faith boldly in our, our relationships. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you know, the difference between the apostles you know, dying for their faith versus you know, me dying for Catholicism or someone dying for a false religion is that you know, the apostles, I and someone dying for a false religion are all giving a testament to the sincerity of our belief, but no one's accusing me of faking Christ's resurrection. That's and right. In many of the other persecuted faiths we see, we don't believe that the people suffering martyrdom have played a direct role in the claims that they're testifying to. That's exactly right. So one of the unique things about Christianity is like Judaism and Islam, it's exclusive. But unlike Judaism and Islam, you, you know, Muhammad didn't claim to be God. He claimed to be a prophet of God. Moses didn't claim to be God, right? But Jesus claimed to be God. And that's the difference. And so Jesus died and then rose again from the dead is the claim. Right? We don't have Muhammad's resurrection from the dead after death. So that sets it apart. And so when, when skeptics claim, well, the disciples stole the body to kind of create this religion, that's where their martyrdom is different. 
is that it shows their sincerity. They couldn't have faked it. With these others, that's not a question. All right, for our next question, uh, we have Annie uh, using someone else's login. So Annie, have I, have I picked you out correctly based on where you have your question? Hi, yes. Um, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Oh, is that okay? Okay, that's fine. I can just ask my question. Um, I was just wondering, um, what do you think is the role of historical evidence in forming one's faith? Like, there are, you know, many different um, ways to see this, right? Like, you could be like, I think the resurrection is very uh, likely to have happened, and therefore, I believe in Christianity, and like, you know, no other evidence, I, I think that's enough. Or you could be like, I'm still like very skeptical, but maybe like um i believe because of other reasons like do you think that there's a spectrum of um or like, like in general do you think what do you think the role of historical evidence should be in helping someone ground their faith excellent question i think it's a complicated one actually but um, so i would say it's going to be different for different people for me for for somebody who is a more skeptical minded like myself Right. I think those are these are these are obstacles that need to be removed, but they're not the most fundamental thing. I used to get really offended when I early when I converted to so before my baptism. Right. And before my confessions, I was I get offended when people say, well, atheism, skeptic, you know, this is really a spiritual issue. I'm like, no, it's rational. I had real questions. and I did have real questions, but I was also a sinner. And I didn't recognize that. And then I was baptized and I was in the confessional the next week. And I had many, many confessions since, you know, every week for since 1999. Um, and, uh, and and now I realize there are a lot more spiritual things going on. And, and it, you know, I think historical evidence for the purposes of feeding the faith can be helpful when you encounter somebody who is a real skeptic, more than historical evidence, don't, don't not give it, but more than that, you need to love them. You need to pray for them. And I think your prayers and your fasting will go far more than anything you say. And whatever you say, how you say it's going to be more important than what you say. So I think there's a lot, this is really, I, I really didn't, I kind of ignored that my first several years as a new convert. But I think it's really important. The part I didn't share because of, because of time constraints is, is how I really, really believe now is that my conversion wasn't so much my argumentation, my reading, the scholarship. That's how I narrated it for many, many years. I later found out that my Bible study leaders had fasted and prayed that entire summer for their future Bible study. And so as opposed to having six to nine members, we had 40 and nine of us came to faith in Jesus for the first time, myself and the Bible study leader and, and another friend of ours, Eric Rausch, now Father Eric Rausch, entered the Catholic Church in, uh, a couple years later. So it led to three of our conversions to the Catholic Church. This is an evangelical Protestant Bible study. Uh, one of them is now, uh, well, somebody you probably know him, Jason Shanks, the president of our Sunday Visitor Institute, who just miraculously was healed to the intercession of St. Jude from COVID. Uh, some of many of this has become a famous story. So some of you might know him. He was my Bible study leader. And Eric Rausch is a priest for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati and myself. So, um, so history has a role, but I think it's a much more limited role. I think it's gonna help remove smaller obstacles, okay? They're important obstacles, but they're small. The spiritual ones are fundamental. And I think we need to love others authentically. We need to listen, that's gonna help. But I also think history plays an important role in formation. The more we know about history, the better we're going to understand the scriptures. And I think that's important because God entered history and the scriptures are a testimony to that. They're an inspired testimony to that. So I think it is important to learn the historical background so that we can understand the scriptures better. That, that's how I would respond to that. We have another anonymous question from someone who wants to know, you know, you've kind of by making the case for Christ's resurrection, it feels like you've told us a lot of the story about how you became a Christian, but what led you from being an evangelical to being a Catholic? Right. So the short, the short story, the short story is, uh, so, you know, I entered the world of Christianity as an evangelical. Nobody was asking me to get baptized because it just wasn't my background. And they thought it was just a symbol. And um, I started to realize going to different churches that there's a lot of different versions of Christianity. And they sometimes disagree on pretty significant things. Like, how do you get to heaven? That's a pretty significant issue. Right? So I, you know, the one, the two Bible study leaders were was co-led by Biff Roca, who was Catholic. He had come back to the Catholic church and Jason Shanks, who was investigating Catholicism. So I started looking into that. I started reading some of the major kind of uh, evangelical, especially reformed Calvinist theologians that were, you know, I started reading the early church fathers. Um, I read uh, the Reformation, you know, some of Martin Luther, 
especially his commentary in Romans is very important for me and uh, John Calvin's commentary in the Gospel of John. And um, I, I became, the short story is basically, I became convinced that the Bible, right, it teaches Catholicism, that Catholicism is far more biblical than the so-called biblical Christianity I was experiencing, that the early church was Catholic. They believed the basically the same things. Um, and at the Reformation, I began to disagree with a lot of their theological reasons for breaking away, finding them unbiblical. That's the short story. So I became convinced that Jesus was calling me to enter the Catholic church, which he found as, uh, as evidenced in scripture. So that's the very short, you know, version. I have a question of my own, uh, which is that I have a similar background to you in some ways. You know, I, I grew up as a non-religious Jew and became Catholic with no pit stops along the way as it happens. Um, but one of the reasons I never considered this question seriously is just it felt like everyone didn't consider the question of, of real historical evidence for Christ's resurrection seriously. Um, it didn't occur to me there were historians making a real case for it. I thought everyone agreed it was just the Bible um, and it never rose to the level of this deserves investigation to me. Even when I started looking into Catholicism, it wasn't through a historical lens. It was purely as a, a philosophical or metaphysical claim. So how do we as Catholics kind of respond to a culture where this question is totally ignored or pushed aside? Um, when we run into people go, why would you even raise this as a topic? I personally, I think that's okay. I think we don't have to put it forward as the topic. I, I mean, when I first converted, I just thought everybody's got to be like me, you know, and that's how everybody has to fit my mold. And and that's just not how God works. God works in the most crazy ways we can imagine. I, mean, I know people, you know, they lapsed Catholic, they became an atheist, they had a good confession, and then boom, you know, everything changes. Or people have come to the faith in so many different ways. Somebody else, they grew up or whatever, and they 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 had a Catholic family that was really amazing family life, and they become, you know, so I think. We have to respect the freedom of everybody we meet, how God has created all of us differently. And I don't think we need to put forward the historical claims as, unless that person seems to be hardwired for that and they have those issues. I think what we need to do is we need to help share the beauty, the treasure that we have in whatever way we can. And we do this best through friendship and through sharing with others, you know, and people and things come up. In that, and then when people, they might, so I think the best way to do apologetics is not to bring it, right? It's more, it's more when issues are raised. Well, how do you deal with this? Well, here's how I deal with that. This is what I think. Oh, I never knew that. You know, that's, I think, much more effective. And so I think we need to respect how God makes everybody unique. And as they come to us, we need to learn to listen to them and love them. Then we can understand them. And what's going to work, it's just like children, right? So my seven kids, they're just all different. They're just all different. And, and what works for one doesn't work for another. I'm not sure what works for any of them, to be honest. But, but good parents know what works for their kids. And they try something different for the other one to get them to do the same good thing. I think that's, that's the key is we have to help put them in count, encounter with God who loves them so much. And everybody's going to have that path in a different way. Andy, I'm moving you up next to be our next question asker. And that totally resonates with me. It's amazing how how many ways God can speak to people, uh, you know, and in so many different languages of art, of you know, historicity, of the gospels themselves, and he really finds a way to speak to us. Uh, so thank you very much, a great, great talk. Um, wondered uh, if you were in the position of a spiritual advisor to uh, Mother Teresa or many other uh, prominent believers known to uh, have, have said that they um, struggled with dark nights of the soul uh, about retaining their faith. Uh, what what uh, what would you have said to help them in their struggles? Oh gosh, that's a really difficult one. Um, I yeah, I would I would have to try to encourage them as best as I can, right? Because of course, dark nights can come for different reasons. Dark nights can come from our own sins. I think if I had a dark night, that would probably be why I did. That's certainly not the case with Mother Teresa. That's certainly not the case with, you know, what John of the Cross is describing. Others have dark nights because God is trying to draw them closer to himself. Others have it because God wants them to suffer for love in a particular way for others. So there's a lot of different reasons. So I would have to try to figure out as best I can if I was somebody's spiritual advisor, well, it makes sense you're doing that. You know, you're, you're look what you're doing with, you know, prostitutes and you murder your neighbor and you're selling heroin. Well, you know, don't you know? Don't expect all kinds of romance with the Lord. Um, 
but for others, you know, it's going to be more complicated. And so I, I don't know. I just would try to accompany them, pray for them, and try to encourage them as best as I can. As I, I really don't know. It would be a very difficult situation to be in. It's a very challenging question. Yeah. Um, here's here's another challenging question from an anonymous attendee, which is, uh, one of our attendees asks, you know, presumably hallucinations on a large scale are part of how people come up with false supernatural claims. Um, you know, how do you explain kind of big claims from other faiths that do make supernatural claims that people are willing to suffer for? Uh, that's a different kind of explanation than the explanation we give for Christ. Well, I don't necessarily think they would be, I don't, I don't think it would be uh, hallucin the group hallucinations. Um, I would have to take case by case and look at them. And I might not be able to find an answer, especially if things are very old and don't have a lot of evidence for them. If they're more recent, we'd have to look at what's going on. But, um, but there's also, there are cases where things can be tricked. That's why, again, I looked into, you know, Jesus is, you know, did the disciples trick everybody? That, that is something that has to be explored. And, and you'd have to have an argument against that as a possibility. I also believe in demons, right? So there are demons in this world that can be, you know, there are spirits beyond God. This is why it's so important. You're hearing voices and you, you know, don't just believe it's God, right? You have to test the spirits, take it up to your confessor, your spiritual director, you know, bring it to somebody else who has some objectivity, right? Um, so, you know, that's also part of what could be going on. And then if you talk about an ancient religion, you have to examine the historical evidence. I mean, we're really lucky with the New Testament that these texts are so close to the events, right? Whereas for most religious traditions, that's just not the case historically. I'm talking about ancient religions. It's simply not the case. We don't know. In fact, a lot of ancient historical texts are post-Christian, even if they're pre-Christian. And so we just don't know how much have been influenced by Christianity. A lot of times they say, well, this influenced Christianity. Usually it's the opposite. So you have to take it case by case. All right, and one, one final question is, uh, again, about your own kind of religious background. Uh, you were raised Jewish. Were you waiting for the Messiah before you discovered Christ was he? No, no, and actually my, my own Judaism is kind of, you have to explain it more in the book in more detail and on interviews and stuff. So my mother's not Jewish. I wouldn't have been considered Jewish by the Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem. You know, we didn't really relate with much of a religious tradition at all. When I lived with my father, uh, after my parents separated, I... Um, then I was more of a Jewish home and I went to Hebrew school, it was bar mitzvah because it was important to me, but it was important as a family tradition. I didn't really, the faith wasn't mine. I, I loved Passover, right? I love the family and the richness and the, and the history and the tradition, but I didn't believe in a Messiah. I didn't believe in God. So I wasn't personally waiting for a Messiah, although I know Jews who are. I'll just ask a brief follow-up that again, parallels my own life here. How, how did becoming Catholic change your view of your heritage of being Jewish? You know, because again, for me, it went from being an ethnic and cultural identity for me to being a real claim about God having a chosen people. Oh, yeah. Same for me. Exactly the same. I, if anything, I appreciated it more. I even appreciated my bar mitzvah, the readings more now than I did then. I remember being at a Passover with my family later, and it's just it's even richer. Dr. Moreau, thank you so much for joining us uh, and starting off Holy Week with this meditation on how we know Christ in history, as well as how we know him in our personal lives and how we receive him bodily in the Eucharist. I thank just want you. to remind everyone that you know, this week, you know, if you haven't already, you can register or try to register with St. Paul's, which is mostly filled up. It's Easter celebrations. You can get on a wait list or check with other students to join their boxes at St. Paul's, but you need no registration at all to come to Tuesday night adoration from 9 to 10 p.m. with confession. Stations of the Cross on Friday at 7 p.m. at the University Chapel. And late night Easter vigil, 11 p.m. till not technically dawn, but until, you know, the next day, really, at St. Paul's to celebrate Christ's resurrection. We can't wait to celebrate this Holy Week with you, uh, and we're all very much looking forward to Easter, especially after missing you all last semester, last year, when everyone was sent home before we could celebrate these feasts together. I'd like to ask Father Zach to help us close out in prayer before we go. Thank you so much. And I just really appreciate your dedication to Seeking for Truth. I was showing students before uh, how extensive your footnotes are in your books and how incredible that is. It's just such a, a resource of going deeper. And uh, as I'm always trying to encourage the students in the seminar, 
to be able to take from that to keep exploring on their own and to question themselves and keep uh, asking questions and seeking and knocking because as Jesus says, then that'll really lead to the answer which will be Christ himself and really lead to a deepening in faith. So I really, yeah, thank you for not only your intellectual honesty and curiosity, but then also, all, as you said, the example of your own life and the way that uh, you live that with uh, with humility uh, and uh, and ever seeking integrity. So thank you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God of history, a God who created us to be in relationship with yourself, who has journeyed with us in this earthly pilgrimage and has ultimately sent your son to share in our humanity so that we could share in his divinity. We ask for your blessing upon us during this holy week as we make our way to celebrate Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. We ask that we can be grow in greater conformity to, to Christ and come to truly encounter the risen Lord, who uh, is the Lord of history, but also a Lord of our own history, so that he can transform us, so that we can live uh, in him and with him and through him now, but also to live for all eternity in that eternal exchange of love in the Trinity. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight.